and meant them to illustrate the tragedy of asking fine young men who naturally abhorred brutality to commit these horrible war crimes. But the press twisted her statements beyond recognition, accusing Jane of saying that the soldiers were not brave and heroic, but merely half drunk. Consequently, she became the target of scathing letters in every newspaper in the country. Indeed, an entire newspaper campaign was launched against her, the New York Times included. Jane Addams became very ill at this time, and she wrote, during weeks of feverish discomfort, I experienced a widespread misunderstanding which brought me very near to self-pity, perhaps the lowest pit into which human nature can sink. She wrote, too, of how comfortable it must be to belong to the mass of unquestioning citizenry and how lonely pacifists feel during wartime. She wrote, we never cease to miss the unquestioning comradeship experienced by our fellow citizens during the war, nor to feel curiously outside the enchantment given to any human emotion when it is shared by millions of others. The force of the majority was so overwhelming that it seemed not only impossible to hold to one's own against it, but at moments absolutely unnatural and one secretly yearned to participate in the folly of all mankind. The misunderstanding on the part of old friends and associates and the charge of lack of patriotism was far easier to bear than those dark periods of faint-heartedness. Jane Addams was indeed a giant and is now a great name about whom much has been written and much more should be. But she was also a woman who suffered and got sick when she was publicly ridiculed and misunderstood. She was a woman who had fears and who made mistakes. She was a woman who occasionally got discouraged and felt alone and afraid. Despite her greatness then, her life can serve as a reassuring reminder when we feel afraid, and discouraged, inadequate. That to be courageous means to be able to have all of these feelings and still continue in the fight for peace and justice. So let us celebrate the courage of this woman who came before us making the connections between a variety of struggles, understanding that peace on earth meant more than the absence of war, that it meant justice for the poor and working people, justice for women, food for the children, love for one's neighbors. Let us celebrate the courage of this woman who dared to take a lonely stand and endured extensive public humili humiliation and who kept going circle the room, searching. Are you the peacemaker? How will you answer? Before closing, I would like to comment briefly on the feminist notion of peace. Why, in celebrating the courage of peacemaking women, did I offer the name of Susan B. Anthony, known primarily for her work in women's suffrage, or Sojourner Truth, who championed the rights of blacks and women, were they peacemakers? A few years ago, I wrote an article for a pacifist magazine about why the feminist movement is so leery of the peace movement. I suggested there that the peace movement has tended to delegate things like rape, and wife battery to the shadowy realm of issues to be addressed 
after the world is safe from nuclear holocaust or after the revolution. The argument goes something like this. We can't afford to work on these admittedly crucial issues until we ensure the survival of the planet or there won't be a world in which to have safe homes and safe streets. The peace movement has thus defined peace in a very narrow sense, meaning ridding the world of war, weapons, the bomb. It is thought in terms of issues which could be tackled one at a time in order of priority. Feminist peace activists would be inclined to see this point of view as fragmented. We would argue that the kind of a planet that can house an apartheid, slavery, or any institutional racism, or that can sustain the props of rape and wife beating, is exactly the kind of a planet which must also have guns and bombs for tools of conflict resolution. We would be inclined to say that everything is connected and that we can't talk about nuclear proliferation without also talking about how it's not safe for women to walk down the street. That the patriarchy's violence is found in our bedrooms and in the television commercials and in the churches which promote a concept of God described only in its masculine aspect and in the toy stores that sell toy guns to boys and Barbie dolls to girls and in the movie theaters which offer over and over and over again images of women as victims for our entertainment. The patriarchy's violence is found in all of these as well as on the battlefields and in the Pentagon boardrooms. This doesn't mean that each one of us can work on each one of these aspects of violence, but it does mean that it's essential we understand the connections. For example, when I say that I work for peace on earth, I'm usually referring to my work in the anti-rape and the battered women's movement. For certainly there could be no peace on earth while women are still being raped on the streets and beaten in our homes. Indeed, the violence in our homes increases the tolerance for the violence in the rest of the world. It is crucial that we begin to understand peace to mean not only an end to war, but an end to all the ways that we do violence to ourselves, to each other, to the animals, and to the earth. This is something which I think is going to be repeated a lot during this week at the conference. According to your program, weaving peace encompasses a broad perspective on peace issues, focusing on the role of women in the global peace movement, nuclear arms issues, interpersonal peace, peace education, peaceful lifestyles, and inner peace. Wow, this is going to be some conference. I'll talk about all that. In closing, I would like to read a poem from the anthology I edited, Reweaving the Web of Life, Feminism and Nonviolence. The voices, let me just take a minute to say something about the book. The voices in this anthology address a wide spectrum of concerns. There are analyses of the interplay of patriarchy and violence, patriarchy being a system which distorts the lives of both men and women. And that's how it's used in this book. The interplay of war and rape, historical accounts of women's involvement in the abolition, suffrage, anti-lynching and civil rights movements, and personal accounts of feminists in the peace movement. The poem I'm going to read is by Ellen Bass, who was a West Coast poet. And this poem weaves together images of the many faces of violence which engulf our lives, especially the threats of rape, nuclear power plant accidents, and nuclear holocaust. But this poem 
transcends the bleak vision with a powerful fantasy of women unleashing all the rage in our hearts and then gathering the whole world again into our strong arms as we dance victorious in celebration of life. And I, again, I, I do want to warn you, this poem really does bring you down, but hold out because I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's really too hard to read it. I just read the first three parts. It does really reach a very healing, wonderful vision, so hang on. <laughs> Our Stunning Harvest. One. She recognizes miner's lettuce nibbles its round leaf. Her father asks, do you know not to eat the other plants? She nods her head solemnly. We have taught her not to swallow pits of cherries or olives. She spits them out bald and repeats, could make a child sick. And walking, when we hear a car, she runs to the side of the road stands stationary until it passes. But how do I protect her from men who rape children, from poison in the air, from nuclear holocaust? I walk this road, oak trees, eucalyptus, blackberry bushes in white flower, the hard green fruit pushing out behind the blossoms. The first time I have walked here alone since that day almost two years ago when I carried her in my belly the morning before her birth. It was dustier then, drought, the smell of hot clay and stillness in the tall Queen Anne's lace. Today the breeze is cool, but the dread, the urgency etch my pleasure like acid. At night, I lie in bed, imagining what I will do if attacked. Alone, I could run or fight. But with her in the stroller, holding my hand on this country road, a mother bird flutters and distracts. She risks her life, but the babies are protected. I could not even protect her. She is too small to run. If I whispered, run, she would not go. And if I tried to carry her, we would be overcome. I could not fight with her, not far from help. I am prey. With her as hostage, I am blackmail. And if I am not enough, if they want her too, my husband sleeps by my side his regular sleep breath. I lean closer, try to absorb the calm. But the possibilities do not stop. I don't let them. I keep trying scenarios, get as far as convincing the rapist to let me take her to her neighbor, then rushing into the house and locking him out. But he may not even speak English. I sober myself. And besides, I am sick in the night, sick the next day. My stomach won't digest food. It runs through me, foul waste. By night, I fall asleep. She sleeps in the crook of my arm. We sleep for hours. For these few hours, we are safe. I know we have been safe afterward. Two. Yesterday I read they tried to kill Dr. Rosalie Bertel, a nun who researched radiation-caused cancer. Here, the Resource Center for Nonviolence is shot up, tires slashed. <coughs> My husband is limiting his practice so he can work against nuclear destruction. He says, we may be in danger, you know. If the steering on the car ever feels funny, pull right over. He's had the lug nuts loosened before. But we both know this is not the greatest danger. Radiation from Love Creek, Church Rock, 
Rocky Flats, Three Mile Island, West Valley, Hanford. We live near the San Andreas Fault. An earthquake and the Diablo Canyon plant could kill millions. And bombs, trident, the draft beginning again. Who are these madmen whose lives are so barren, so desperate, they love nothing? What will it take to make them change? What will it take? What will it take to make me change? I still use plastic bags from Dow Chemical. When am I going to stop? Three. I want to talk to the president. I want to go with other mothers and meet with the president. And I want mothers from Russia there and the head of Russia and Chinese mothers and the head of China and mothers from Saudi Arabia and Japan and South Africa and all the heads of state and the families of the heads of state and the children, all the children of the mothers. I want a meeting. I want to ask the president, is there nothing precious to you? And when the president explains how it's the Russians, I want the Russian women to say, oh, we don't want war. I want all the women to scream, we don't want war. We, the people, do not want war. And I want the president to admit that he wants war. He wants power and money and war more than he wants the lives of his children. I want to see him turn to his children and tell them they will not live, that no one will live, that with one computer error, all life on this planet can be annihilated, that two men could go mad and push one button in a silo, in a plane, that these men do go mad. The men with access to the buttons go mad all the time, are replaced, that one might not be replaced soon enough. I want each head of state to tell his children what will happen if any country sends a thermonuclear bomb. I want each head of state with his own tongue to tell his children how the computers of the other country would pick up the signal, how they would fire back, how the bombs would hit. I want each president and prime minister and king to tell his children how firestorms would burn, vaporizing people, animals, plants, and then as days passed, how the millions would die of radiation sickness, their skin sloughing off, the nausea, a hair falling out, hemorrhage, infection, no hospitals, no clean water, the stench of dead and decaying bodies, bacteria and virus rampant, insects rampant, and the radiation ticking, ticking, as millions more die over the next years, leukemia, cancer, and no hope for the future. Birth deformity, stillbirth, miscarriage, sterility, millions and billions. I want them to watch the faces of their children. I want them to watch their eyes pale, the flecks of light fading, and when the children ask, why? I want them to point to the other heads of state and the others to point back. And I want the mothers screaming. I want the mothers of the children of the heads of state screaming. I want them to scream until their voices are hoarse whispers, raw as the bloody rising of the sun. I want them to hiss. How dare you? How dare you? Kill them yourself then. Kill them here now with your own hands. Kill all these children. Clench your hands around their necks. Crunch their spines. Kill one, two, three. Kill hundreds. If you are going to kill, then kill. 
I want to see the faces of the president, the premier, the prime minister, the chancellor, the king. I want to see their faces tremble. I want to see them tremble like a still lake under wind. I want to see them weep. I must be crazy myself. My mother is an optimist. She believes in a survival instinct. She has read the statistics, knows plutonium is poison for 500,000 years, but she does not think of these things. It depresses her, she says. I say she is naive, but I write poems in which presidents and cabinets, precise, dauntless. I want her spirit to inspire us. I don't want to hear about numbers. I don't want to hear one number about how many bombs or how much money or dates or megatons or anything else. I want to hear no more. I want to hear my child will not be murdered. My child will live. I want to dance victorious, to dance and dance, ring around the rosy with no one falling down. No ashes, no ashes. I want no ashes from my child's tender head. I want to dance. I want to sing. I want to kiss all the heads of state, all the mothers, every child. I want to kiss them all and dance the hora, dance the mazurka, the waltz, the tribal dances, bare feet on red clay, on white sand, on black earth. Dancing, kissing, singing, dancing, dancing until our legs are strong, our arms strong, our thighs, lungs, bellies strong, until our voices are loud, clear, and vibrant with the wind, until we ride the wind, until we ride home with the wind, flying, flying, laughing, kissing, singing, cackling, our children tucked under our wings, safe, safe, we are safe, we are so strong, we can protect our children. one. <laughs> I used to really not be able to read that because I could never get beyond that part about the little red sneakered feet. <laughs> really couldn't make it, but I'm getting the answer. Uh, I guess we have some little time for questions if anybody wants to ask. It's also just fine with me if you don't. <laughs> Seriously. Uh huh. Um, well, like I said, I grew up in a farm in New York State and uh, went to college in Pennsylvania. Um, let's see, <laughs> myself. <laughs> That's a hard question. Um, I, I can tell you how this book started. Uh, I had been writing for quite a while about feminism and nonviolence, and especially I've been writing have been writing a long time about violence against women. Excuse me. And um, I wrote that article about why feminists are so leery of the peace movement. And some folks down in Philadelphia read it and asked me if I would come down and um, help lead a workshop down there. They were doing a workshop about uh, nonviolence. And they were going to spend one night on feminism and and pacifism. So I did go down and I spent two nights there. One night was with the, the workshop and the other night I spent just with women talking about the connections. And it really felt like new stuff. And, whoops, excuse me. Um, even the really shy, it was like one of those really exciting meetings where even really the real shy people talk, you know. 
And it was so exciting. There were some women there who were involved with the publishing group. And they said, you know, this would make a great book. Uh, would you do it? And I was so isolated at that time in my life. I really didn't know anybody else. This is probably my own fault, really. But I didn't know anybody else who <coughs> was uh, a, a feminist and a pacifist. <laughs> well, I, know, I knew a couple of people. I had figured, and Barbara Deming, mainly. I knew her. But, um, so I thought that I'd be putting together a pamphlet. <laughs> Well, you can see this is not a pamphlet. And, and also, now it's, it hasn't been out quite a year, and it's um, selling everywhere in um, New Zealand, even. <laughs> um, getting requests for translations uh, from Poland and uh, Germany, India, uh, Switzerland. So I, I guess I was wrong about it, just appealing to a couple people. And it's really been good for me because now I'm getting a chance to, to meet people. I don't feel so isolated myself anymore. I think, I'll just add this, I think the reason I felt so isolated, part of the reason was in, in the community that I'm mostly involved with, the, the community um, concerned with uh, violence against women. It's real hard to be in that and become a pacifist. I mean, really, you, you just want to kill. It's really the real feeling, and I had that feeling, too. But I became a pacifist. So I kind of went a different route. I became a pacifist while I was involved in that because I just don't want to help bring about any more violence on this earth. You work in a rape crisis center for one day, and you really have heard enough about violence. So. Any more questions? Well, I will be here all week, so I hope you're not shy, because I don't know anybody else in Iowa. <laughs> so please, you know, come up and talk to me. really would like that. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody.